Hello and welcome to our session today, The Art of Testing Transformation. So we're going to talk about where we've come from and how we've been blending our people skills, our technology and our processes and what we've been doing as professionals in the quality assurance space and test engineering. My name is Jennifer Bonin and for those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, a little bit of background on me. I started my career in consulting implementing large ERP solutions for organizations and companies, and then evolved to working for one of the largest technology companies in the world, and had the opportunity throughout my career to build testing organizations and centers of excellence from the ground up, and have seen how those have had to evolve and change over the last several years um, in our industry. And I've had the advantage point in the last couple of years of working at the C-suite level and working with um, C-level executive CEOs and CIOs and CTOs and chief marketing officers and all of the folks in an organization um, to help them understand the value of what we do and the value of quality assurance and testing in their organizations and proving and showing that value. About a year ago, I took a, a detour off of the journey that I've been on working for a large software development company and decided to make an impact in a different focus specifically on quality and um, with an organization called TAPQA. And we are um, pioneers and innovators in terms of building cutting edge processes and technologies and um, resources to help organizations be successful and take um, their processes and technology and resources to the next level in terms of what they're focused on for their teams and organizations. So it's a great opportunity to go in and help provide insight and strategy and direction to organizations of all sizes, from Fortune 100 um, down to small to medium-sized businesses, and really get a feel for what's working and not working in terms of those organizations. So I'll start off today, now that you know a little bit more about me, with a question to you. And what I need your help with today is I want to understand what each of you want as a key learning or takeaway from this conference, either Eurostar, virtual, or maybe just a takeaway in general from why you're looking, obviously, coming to this session and listening to it today. You have a desire to learn more or advance your career. So what is it that you want to get or take away from your advanced education or the learnings and research that you're doing right now. So what we'll do is I'll ask you for the task to take two minutes uh, to think about what you're focused on and what you want to learn more about or improve in your professional life. So again, just get your pen and paper out and take a couple minutes here and think about what you're focused on, what you want to improve, or what you want to learn for your current professional life. Once you've had an opportunity to write that down, I'm then going to ask, as a part of that, that you think of the five people you reached out to in the last month in your professional network. So think about up to five people that you've personally connected with over the last month that are in your network around what you're trying to achieve and where you're going for your next step in your career and for furthering your skills. We'll talk more after the time is up about what the business benefit to doing this is. And I know some of you probably right now are thinking, oh gosh, do I really have to sit here for two minutes and think about this? But I will tell you as we start this activity is, with today's day and age and all of our technology and our cell phones and our laptops and how connected we are to everything, it's very rare that we take the opportunity to sit and reflect on what we're doing, where we're going, and how we're getting there. So I really do encourage you to take this two minutes to think about what you're focused on, what your goal is, what you want to learn or improve in your professional life, and then who are those folks that you've reached out to in the last month in your professional network. And be honest, if the answer is none and you haven't spent any time on that, put that down so that that's a starting point for you in terms of where you want to take that and your next goal. So again, let's take two minutes here together to reflect and look at this activity. And then I'll come back in two minutes and we'll talk about what the benefit is for having done this and why we want to spend time on those two activities.
All right. Our two minutes is up. Some of you, I know, probably struggled more than others with that, taking that time. It is very hard to sit and just reflect, and we don't often get the time, nor do we take the time to do that today. But it's really important, and I'll tell you why. So studies have shown that people that take on average 10 minutes a day to set their focus and their goal, reflect on what they're trying to achieve, and then develop their day and set their agenda based on that have improved success on achieving their goals. So again, to achieve the things you want, it's imperative that you take that 10 minutes a day to really focus on what your goal is and then what are you doing to achieve that and how are you getting there? It's very rare with all that we have going on that we actually take that time for ourselves to think about that. So I encourage you, absolutely based on what we know, to take that 10 minutes a day to focus on your goals, what you're doing, and how you're getting there. Then, why do we want to think about reaching out to people in our professional network in our lives? Well, the studies also show us that on average today, people have somewhere between 15 and 20 changes in career or jobs. So in order to make those changes successful and help yourself transform, it's imperative that you're reaching out to your network and letting them know where you're at, what you want to do, and what your next step is. Whether that be people in your current organization that you want to help you get to the next level, or it be people outside the organization where you're exploring what you think your next career adventure will be. It's imperative that you keep in mind how much of that networking you're actually doing every month so that you're prepared should something happen to take that next step, or you're just prepared in arming other people with information about what next step it is that you actually want to take in your career. So again, two things to focus on. What's your focus? What are your goals? And spending 10 minutes a day doing that. And then looking each month at who you're reaching out to and the network and building that network to make sure people understand what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to go in terms of your career. So now that we've done that and we've kind of gotten our mindset around what our focus is and what we want to take away, let's now look at where we've come from. So if we look at it, we start in the mid-90s, which isn't that long ago, less than 20 years ago. Floppy disks, Ethernet cables, and modems were the way of the world. We all were using those things, and those were things that we were used to. Laptops, even, were much different than they are today. We have these laptops now and devices, and a lot of us may not even be using laptops. We're going to the point where tablets and iPads are the way that people are are doing their day-to-day -day transactions, getting their emails and information, and may not even routinely use a PC, a desktop, or a laptop, let alone feeling like we have to be tethered or connected to something. So our world gradually over the last 20 years has become less and less tethered to places and locations and more and more mobile and global. And what you'll also see is things that we didn't think were possible or available 20, less than 20 years ago are now in our day-to-day -day vernacular. So Google, who was just the brain process of two individuals less than 20 years ago, is something that many individuals across the globe use on a daily basis to do their work and to find and get information. So we've seen this huge transformation in terms of just technology and where we've come from. Now, you know, where are we going? And that's kind of to be continued. We haven't yet seen the end of where we're going. What we do know, though, through what we've seen, is that high development velocity, good quality, and testing is important to the outside folks, outside of the testing and quality assurance profession. Today in our newspapers, articles, and around the world, people will talk about what did we do to assure this would work, or what was the rigor that was put in, or what was the level of testing that was done. So you see newspaper articles now based on the fact that there have been several major breaches or failures recently, both with private sector as well as the public sector, in terms of what's going on with new technologies being put out into the market. So I know both in Europe and the U.S. have recently had healthcare initiatives where there have been things like healthcare.gov in the U.S., where people are looking to develop systems rapidly and deploy them so that people can register for their healthcare systems. You now have presidents of countries going in and saying, why didn't this work and what? why didn't we assure that this would work when we rolled it out and that people could access our systems? It's become much, much more visible. 
If you look at the analysts today, Gartner and others, they'll talk about how major failures or breaches and lack of testing and quality assurance in our systems, our integrations, and our applications creates situations where companies could be one breach or failure away from non-existence, and they could cease to exist in the future. So what does that tell us? Now that this is kind of in the mainstay of what people think about today in terms of, you know, people and individuals out in the world. We've learned some things, um, and we've got a lot of information to be positioned, to be in a very influential position now as people in the quality assurance and testing engineering profession. We want to make sure we enable testing to be easier than it was before. It doesn't always have to take as long as it used to. We want to make sure we're shifting left, giving more visibility into what's being done and giving more insight to the developers who are developing the code that we depend on. We're breaking down walls and barriers with Agile and some of the other techniques that are now in place that we're using in our teams and methodologies. What we're seeing is we're more integrated, which creates more collaboration. So working together more closely with our business partners, our development teams, everyone working in tandem together to deliver a common goal. There's also a lot of visibility. So with this great responsibility and, and knowledge of what we do and people asking the questions now comes visibility. So we have to be prepared and ready for the fact that now we are center stage with some of what we do in terms of our testing profession and people are taking what we say very seriously. So it's a high responsibility which means communication is key. We need to make sure that we're adequately communicating information in a very transparent and honest way to the stakeholders that need that information. We've also determined that we need a broader skill base. Today, it's not okay just to know how to do a piece of the testing, that functional piece. You now need to have insight into what do we need to think about from a security perspective? What's the implication from a performance perspective? There's a lot of additional information that we take into play in broadening that skill base. And I'll talk a little bit later about what those intersection points, I think, are in terms of the skill base that we all need to be successful going into the next 10 to 15 years. We also see that testers need to be the customer advocates. And the people in the quality assurance organization need to advocate for the customer. Large Fortune 100 companies are now changing from having vice presidents of QA or quality assurance and process to vice presidents of customer interaction or customer engagement. And what they're saying is, we really want this organization, both around quality assurance and testing, to really advocate for what our customers' needs are and to be that voice of the customer. A lot of testing now revolves around the user experience and what does that look like? And what was developed and does it fit what our users need in terms of customer experience. So that advocate is coming into play more and more. We're also seeing that what's important for us as professionals in the industry is a responsibility not only to understand how to do things in practice, but to also understand the principles behind them. So getting the education you're doing by attending these conferences Going and seeking information is wonderful to get the principles and the theories behind why do we do what we're doing? What's the actual theory behind how Agile works? But at the end of the day, theory is great, but we have to know how to put that into practice in our own organizations. And what I would encourage you to know and stay up on is both not only theory, but the actual practice of how to do it. So blending those two together and understanding both the principles and the practice that go into play. And again, we all need to keep calm. We may not like some of the changes we're seeing. We may not like some of what we're seeing in terms of how people are asking us to do our jobs and how we're being asked to step up. But don't worry. You know what? If you don't like it, probably in the next couple of years, we'll see another shift and another change because we're constantly evolving and transforming. So it's nothing to get overly concerned with in terms of where we're at today because we have to just realize where we're at have knowledge of it, understand our perspective, and know that it probably will change in the future. So what does it look like? So we've talked about this evolution of the technology, the evolution of testing. What we're seeing is 
testing evolved from, you know, in the early 90s to what I would call the, the journey or the, the pioneer version to where we are today. So many of you may be listening or sitting in the audience, we're pioneers, original folks in the industry doing testing in a way that's very different today than it used to be. But those pioneers gave us some things. They gave us some great technology to use and leverage to be as efficient as we could in what we do in our, in our skills and with our testing practices. We've also got a lot of processes and best practices out there. We have access to tons and tons of books and literature and information on how to do things and what the best practices are and how other companies are doing it. And what's beautiful about the advent of internet and access to social media, blogs, Twitter, all of those different social media devices is we have much more real-time access and knowledge sharing that's going on around our profession. So not only inside of our own organizations where you can go on to intranet to get information or instant message people to get answers to questions, we now have instant information sharing in the global community as a whole. There's so many places we can go to get information on how to do something when we come upon a problem we can't solve in our test engineering or in our quality assurance function. We've got a whole industry and practice that's grown up around this. What's also amazing to me that we've seen is there's a whole academic realm to testing. So rather than just a degree in software engineering, there's courses and work that centers around test and quality assurance as a profession, where they're actually teaching it in colleges and universities. More and more today, you're seeing it proliferate through our academic sector as well to educate people on what's being done, how it's being done, and what's out there in terms of the importance of test engineering as a profession and quality assurance. So what's great, all of you out there, you're part of this. You're part of this evolution that has taken place and you're part of where we've come from and where we are today. And that's a great thing to be a part of. So what's the trend we're seeing? I said I'd talk about where I see that intersection and the trend. What we're seeing is the quality assurance is a convergence of three core skill sets. We're seeing that in order to be a professional around quality assurance, you need to have three key skill sets that come together. The knowledge of quality assurance and testing, just the basic skill sets of how do you do it? How do you write a test plan? How do you write a test case? The terminology and the skills around that, how to write a good defect, how to log and enter information in a way that people can understand and act upon it. You've got to have that business or industry knowledge. So being in the industry I, that you're in, I call it contextual relevance. So having some contextual relevance and skills around what the industry is, how it operates, and how your users work and perform in that industry. So having that contextual relevance combined with the skill and knowledge of how quality assurance should be done and using some of those certifications and skills, there's tons of certification programs out there that give people the toolkit to know and understand how quality assurance is being done and the best practices. Then around that contextual relevance is understanding your business, spending time in it, understanding how business users operate, what they're asking for, what they're thinking in terms of where they're going as an industry and a business. And then the third skill is around technology. So understanding the new technologies that are out there and what's available and what your business and industry is demanding as technology that be used for you today. So again, we're moving it more and more towards new advancements in technologies where today, instead of using manual physical credit cards and those leaving your hand for someone to swipe them, you now have the capabilities in some instance to use devices or even your cell phones to scan and record those transactions instead of you having to hand over a separate credit card. And as we all know in Europe and other places, they're talking about single cards that do all of your transactions and link all of your cards together instead of people carrying a stack of cards that they would need to use to purchase things as they move around and go to different stores. We're moving more and more away from paper-based things and more and more to electronic-based in ways of interacting and connecting. And with that comes a whole new set of challenges around securing information and data that's put out there. 
how do you understand what information has been put out and some of it not being able to actually be pulled back. So actually understanding that technology, how it interacts, and what the potential downfalls and pitfalls are of the technology that we're using and how to test for that. So again, I would encourage you as, as professionals in your industry to look at how good am I in each of these rings and where would I rate myself in terms of my skills around quality assurance, business and industry knowledge, and technology. And make sure that you're focusing on all three. Sometimes we tend to focus in on one and think that that will be the way to go. But I think the people and the folks who come more into that middle space of these three circles where they converge are the ones who are going to be in the most high demand as we go forward. Because as I work with clients and customers, what they're asking for is they want that magic quadrant of people that have all three skill sets that they're able to blend and utilize in their organization. So just think about that for yourself. Where do you see yourself sitting and fitting in terms of these skills? And are you able to actually blend the three and come to that center ring in terms of your skill set? So again, it's all about when we look at this, you know, as we're seeing these trends and how we need to evolve, our own organizations need to evolve in terms of their, the people in the organization, what they're learning, the processes we're using, and the technologies that we use to do our jobs. So we're seeing that convergence as well. And now today what's interesting about the technology and the process is you can get information on those. Those are the easy parts. What's the hardest part in organizations to transform is actually the people and making that shift in the skills and the knowledge and where they want to go for their careers. Evolving and change is a process. There's, it happens over time. It's not going to happen overnight. So even those of you who decide, you know what, I want to shift my skills. I want to become more of a blended skill set in terms of my own skills in the quality assurance and testing profession. It takes time and it takes focus to get there. So organizations, you know, what I always say, there's some prerequisites before you decide to make a change, whether that change be, you know, going to Agile, whether that change be spinning up new technologies. In order to do that, what I always say is we've got to look at where are we at today. And often what we fail to document or recognize or put down on paper and agree to is what our current state is. So where are we today and, and what does that look like? And once you have that information where all the stakeholders agree, here's what we, where we're at today and where we're going to, you can then say, based on where I'm at, where do I want to be and what is my future? And what does that future state look like? And you can see then what the transition state is to evolve to get to that future. But in order to do that, again, you have to document that current state Understand then the difference and the future state you want to achieve and then understand that transition. In doing that, there's three things that you need as well, which is a motivation. Why are we doing this? Why are we making this change? A vision. How are we going to make this change and what do we want that to look like when we're done? And then an implementation strategy of how are we going to get there and what are the steps we have to take to actually get to our future state. So again, I think it's a, a matter of documenting current state, future state, and then understanding underlying that. What's my motivation? What's the vision for what I want to be? And then what is the way or the plan forward for how we get there? I want to play a quick little video for you here just on change and observing how we change in our behaviors and just kind of how we view the world. We're going to take a look now at the quick video that shows us a little bit about our behavior in relation to when we're asked to make a change and ways we can maybe encourage or help people want to make change.
the video showed us a little bit about how if we just change the approach a little bit to what we were asking people to do and we give them a little bit more fun in terms of injecting that and how we're asking them to make change, we sometimes have more success in getting people to change their behavior. I'll give you another recent example I had. I travel a lot on airplanes and I was on an airplane and usually when you sit in the exit rows, they come by and just say, have you read the safety briefing card? Respond affirmatively, yes. And everyone just shakes their head and says yes to the individual coming through. Well, I was sitting on a plane and was not in the exit row, but could see the flight attendant coming down. And she stopped at the row that had the three passengers on each side that were seated in the exit row. And she said, do you understand that you are seated in the exit row? And they all said, yes. She said, then I will assure that you guys can give me the three steps to tell me how to exit this aircraft in case of an emergency. Look of sheer panic and terror on the faces of those six individuals was palatable. Now, what they were expecting was she was just going to say, you've read the safety instructions and you understand how they operate, and they would have responded yes. She, instead, having known that usually people don't actually read that, made a little bit different approach and said, give me the three steps to actually exit this aircraft. Then she proceeded to say, I will come back in five minutes and make sure you're all ready and prepared to sit in the exit row. Now what she was doing was changing up that approach and maybe hers wasn't as fun for them as, as we think that the video was, but what it did do was it made a point. The point being that if we change the way we ask people to do things or we give it the information a little bit different way, it may net out a different result. So if you're having challenges in your organization, not getting people to do or make the changes that you want from a quality perspective is maybe change the messaging a little or give it to them in a different way than you've tried in the past. Also understand and know on this slide as we're looking at is the impact of introducing changes is that if what we're trying to do in our current state and our culture of our organization around our beliefs, assumptions, and behaviors doesn't match, attempts to make changes that are radically different than our current culture usually results in people not accepting those changes. So even if we change the approach, give it to them in a very you know, understanding way, people may not make the change because we're introducing changes that aren't consistent with the current culture of our organization. So the rule of thumb is, Check first to see if the change you're making aligns with your company and organizational culture. If it doesn't, the changes usually aren't successful. Now, that's not to say there aren't exceptions to that, but they usually are not successful if they're contradictory to your current organization. So what we see again around culture, just to be clear about what a culture in an organization is, is it surrounds yourself around behaviors and beliefs, norms, expectations, assumptions, and values that your company operates by. And again, you need to make sure that the changes you're trying to make align fundamentally to the culture of your organization. And I love this picture around culture because it just demonstrates that iceberg model of there are certain pieces of culture that are very visible that we all see in our organizations. And then there's all the stuff below the surface around norms, expectations, assumptions, and values, which we can't see. It's those things that are hidden underneath that we need to be aware of as well and make sure that any change we're recommending really aligns to that fundamental culture of the organization we're operating in. And you, as an individual in an organization, needs to assess then, do your values of your organization's culture fit who you are fundamentally as a person? Why that's important is, as things are transforming and changing, you want to make sure as a professional in quality assurance and test engineering that what you value in terms of your role how you contribute and how you operate in your organization fit the values that you personally have and those align to the values your organization has. Because again, if culture always wins, you want to make sure there's alignment between your values and what you see as important and your organization. So I encourage you outside of this session to take some time to assess the culture of your organization and your own personal values. And sometimes when we see things just aren't meshing or we're not getting the change we want to see in the organization, it really has fundamentally to do with those values that aren't in alignment between us and the organization we're operating in. Keep in mind as we're going through these changes, there's several different types of change that can occur in organizations. 
the first one we think of is team synergies and processes and tools. A lot of times as we have mergers and acquisitions in organizations, we have to have these synergies that take place around optimizing tools and processes. There also can be ones around creating new paradigms or developing new ways to add value or needing to improve customer satisfaction. Examples of that surround a lot around our mobile devices today. As new technologies evolve, everyone awaits what Apple's new announcements will be for their new devices. They're looking at ways of how do we optimize and get our devices ingrained in people's way of operating in day-to-day -day business. Because the more they can connect you to that device, the more brand loyalty they tend to see and repeat business of people coming back to, to that particular manufacturer of a device to utilize their particular tools as opposed to another one. Strategic planning. Maybe a new plan is required due to organizational channel changes or new competitors in your industry. Maybe someone who formerly didn't used to be in that industry has now decided that's a new strategic way for them to go. So you have to plan and be prepared for what that means as there's those new competitors entering your market space that you didn't anticipate. So again, when you're looking at change and you're thinking about what changes you want to make, think of them in the context of how do they fit? Is it really about process and tools? Is it about creating this paradigm shift? Or is it around some strategic planning event that we need to take advantage of? And in testing and test engineering, what we always have to remember is if we can't measure it, you can't understand or control it. So there has to be a way to measure the change we're making in our organization. Make sure that whatever that change is, that you have a way to accurately measure, monitor, and show what those changes are that are being made. So ways to create visibility and enhanced awareness of what the changes are and the impact and return on investment. Everyone's big on how did we do it and what did we do and, and how much difference did that make. So understanding what that return on investment and difference is that you're making is critical as you're making changes. Some of the impacts of these new strategies that people have put in place in their organizations have been huge. Being able to roll out new features in 90 days, search in less than 48 hours, and a new version of Chrome every six weeks. These are new things that we're seeing. The velocity and the speed at which we're all able to measure and monitor and move forward has increased dramatically. We're able to roll new things out all the time in a much more rapid pace and with much more stability. So besides being able to have the velocity, it's about stability of those changes as well. So if you're rolling new versions out every couple of weeks, what your users want to know is not only do I get a new version, but I'm pretty confident that that version that I'm going to use is actually going to work. So relate that to your own industries and how you create assurance in those users that what they're getting from you not only works, but that they can rely that they're getting new advancements on the speed at which they want to receive them and that they're working reliably and they're stable. So those are the things that we're seeing in terms of the new strategies that have been put in place. How do we continue to evolve? How do we continue to stay up with these new trends and you know, be aware and open to what's happening in our industry? We always have to respect differing points of view. We'll all have them. There's lots of different points of view. Respect those points of view. When you see new things come out, determine and develop plans of how you're going to implement them and plans of action. What do you want to do and how are you actually going to take advantage of those new strategies? Establish synergistic relationships between key people in your organization. So project management, development, um, business analysts, the business community. Make sure you have those synergistic relationships so that when you need to make a change that impacts more than just your team or your particular group, you have those relationships to delve into to be able to make those changes. Use multiple ways to communicate information to people. Everyone has different ways they like to receive and get information. So changing it up, sometimes it's emails, sometimes it's town halls, sometimes it's informal discussions and drop by. Make sure you know what style of communication works best for key stakeholders and utilize multiple different styles when communicating what the changes are that you're making. Try and build as much commitment as you can. Anticipate and manage resistance because we all know there is. With change, people resist and there will always be people who resist. So anticipate that ahead of time and actually actively manage it. And also understand power and influence in organizations. 
So people may not have technical power in terms of their title or their role, but they have huge influence. So understand both the powerful individuals in your organizations and the influencers in your organizations. Two very different things, but both very important in terms of making change. So you've identified you want to make a change. You've found something that helps you evolve and aligns to your current culture of your organization. But what are you going to do next? The biggest step to whether or not what you're doing succeeds or fails has to do around your plan and your strategy of how to communicate that information out to the people impacted. And what we know from studies, only 7% of what people take out of communication is what we actually say. The rest of it has to do with interpretation, context, body language, and the tone of our voice. So in other words, 7% is about what we say, the rest is all about who you're saying this to. So be very careful when you're communicating messages about the tone of your voice, context, and body language, especially dealing globally. Because in the global market, there's different norms and social standards for body language and context than there is in other countries and cultures. So be very aware of what those standards are and how people like to receive information. Because again, it's not just what you're saying, but it's all the things around it that people are perceiving. Some of you may know if you have children. When you look at a child and they're giving you information, if that child tends to stare down at the floor while they're talking to you, that may imply something. So if they're not looking directly at us, what do we think that is going on if they're looking directly at the floor? What that may mean is they're actually not being truthful. So keep in mind your body language and just the simple act of glancing down at the floor as you're giving information to someone may trigger a response in them that you're not giving them the truth or the full information. So be aware of your body language, the tone of your voice, the context around which someone may be interpreting what you're saying to them. And the reason they're not making the change you want is because of the way it's being communicated to them. So again, be very cognizant of the method and way in which you communicate. We all perceive different the world differently. We look at things differently based on how we've been raised and how we grow up. So what we have to be aware of is perception of what you're saying may be different depending on the person that's perceiving what the information you're giving to them. Now, when we look at different people, we all have different perceptions. I can ask a question about about Steve Jobs and say, was he innovative? And some of you will say, absolutely, he was the greatest innovator of our time with what he produced and his forward thinking in terms of the devices that would run our world. But others would say, I don't know that he was. You know, there's varying opinions on this. So again, just goes to the point that we can all look at something as simple as a picture of an individual and have a perception about whether or not that person was a particular thing or not. So now when we deal not just in pictures or in people, when we deal in words, there's even greater perception that goes into those and misinterpretation at times of what's actually being said or what the intent of the message was. So be careful about perception and understanding perceptions from varying different points of view. Not everyone will see things the way you see it. What I'm showing you now is some actual maps that exist in textbooks. These are actual textbooks used and that children learn from. This first map, I'm sure you can maybe guess where it originates and what schools are using this as one of the textbooks that they have for educating children on what the world looks like and their worldview. Any guesses? That's right. It actually comes from textbooks used in the United States. So as you can see in this picture, we've got the US at the center of everything and everything else revolving around it one way to look at it. Here's another one. Again, a map of the world. Same information, basic information was on the map previously, but a different way of looking at it. So a different way to perceive it. This map actually originates, as you can probably guess, in an Australian textbook. Australia is right side up, everyone else upside down. They were sick of being the ones that were always upside down on the map. So they flipped the orientation. So again, these are real maps used in textbooks in schools, not made up. Again, changing perception of how people look at things. And I'll give you one more. Oh. So next one, looking at not only understanding and knowing perception 
but knowing yourself and understanding others. So knowing others and intelligence, but knowing yourself is true wisdom. So understanding yourself, how you perceive information, how you like to get information, and then also taking into effect how you need to understand others is key as we move through trying to make change and communicate. So again, personal awareness as well as awareness of others around us is very key as we're communicating the changes we're trying to make. I'll ask you another question. What percentage of business issues are due to the lack of interpersonal com communication skills and not the competencies of the parties? The reason I ask this question is because sometimes when we actually communicate a change or what we're requesting someone to do than, differently than they used to do is we don't actually have the right way to communicate that information to the individual. So how often is it actually our ability to communicate information and not necessarily the person doesn't know how to do what we're asking them to do? In reality, that's 87% of the time is that it's actually a communication issue and not a skill issue. A lot of times when we communicate and we don't get the result back that we want, say you're you're communicating to one of your developers, one of your colleagues information saying, I need you to help me do X. And when X doesn't come back, you go, oh, well, they just don't know how to do it. In reality, what it may be is the information you gave wasn't received by them in the same way that you gave it. Their perception of those words or what they're supposed to do or the information was completely different than what you told them. On average, if we think about it, how many of us actually go to work every day and say, I want to be bad at what I do? Very few. All of us want to be good at what we do and want to succeed and want to be successful. So we tend to find jobs, careers, and things that we're good at, that we have competency in, that we can be good at. Where we sometimes break down and where it doesn't work is when we're communicating and not communicating effectively for a style that is different from our own way of communicating. So change is about people, again, and how you choose to receive it and adapt to it. You've got to be, in order to be successful about, with changing and with evolving and helping other people change and evolve, you want to focus on your relationship as well as task. You want a common language to communicate with, both verbal and visual, so that you don't have those misperceptions. We always want to seek to understand. So not always come from a fervent point of, here's how I think the world looks, but come from a, how do you see it, point of view. Because we may learn something when we seek to understand. I always say it's best to be part of the change and be part of the group that's trying to look at how to make that change and then see it from all angles and perspectives. There's not just one way to look at change. There's many vantage points to look at it from. So see it from all perspectives and be part of that. Ultimately, we're going to run into some resistance when we're looking at making changes. Make sure that as you're asking people to change or even asking yourself to change, that you're not doing too much. You're not overwhelming them or yourself. Make sure you're educating and raising awareness around what the principles are and what the theory is behind what you're doing. Listen and get to the root of the resistance. Sometimes there's something underlying that's causing people not want to want to change. Understand what that is. Targeting your message and communication by personality, styles, and type. Everyone likes a different type of communication. So understand and know what that is. Get involved. Be part of it. Make sure you get feedback and you all use all of the resources available to you to get that feedback that you need from the participants and other individuals. So what's the net net at the end of the day after you sat through this session? Our cheese has moved um, and will continue to move. The world, the technology, and our profession is changing. So we want to be part of it. So be part of that evolution. Focus on communication and soft skills as well as technical skills. Usually in our world, we're really good about going and getting our technical training, but we sometimes don't see the importance of that softer skills. And really, what makes a difference at the end of the day in being able to get some of those technological changes is being able to communicate it effectively and having those soft skills that will differentiate you from the next person. Use your resources and do your homework. Understand 
how things are changing and be educated on the new technologies, processes, and tools that are out there. And again, putting it back together, practice and principles both matter. We not only need the theory, but we need the practice behind it and how it actually works. It's not just having one or the other. It's having those two things connected together that's going to make us successful. And I'll leave you with something to reflect on. You all chose to listen today or to get more information and have had the opportunity to be more educated on different opportunities that are out there. All of you probably are having an opportunity to both attend this virtual conference as well as, you know, maybe attending the in-person Eurostar conference. So I want to leave you with a little story today. Michael Lewis, who you may all know as the author of Liars, Poker, and Moneyball, among a lot of other famous books, once relayed a group to a story of Princeton graduates, and then I was able to hear that story firsthand and now can share it with you. A few years ago, there was a pair of researchers in the Cal Poly Psych Department that staged an, an experiment. They began by grabbing students as lab rats. They broke the students into team and segregated them by gender. So they would have a team of three men or three women. But each team was a team of three. They then put these teams into a room and arbitrarily assigned one of the three to act as the leader. They gave them a complicated moral problem to solve that they had no real context behind. So saying what should be done about academic cheating or how do we re regulate underage drinking on campus? None of them had had the opportunity to research any of these topics beforehand. Exactly 30 minutes into the problem-solving experiment, the researchers interrupted the groups. They entered the room with a plate of cookies. There were four cookies on each plate. Every team member obviously got one cookie because there were three team members, but that left a fourth cookie just sitting there on the plate. It could have been an extremely awkward moment, but it actually wasn't. With incredible consistency, the person arbitrarily appointed the leader less than an hour ago grabbed the fourth cookie and ate it. Not only ate it, but ate it with gusto, lips smacking, mouth open, drool at the corners of their mouths. In the end, all that was left of the extra cookie were the crumbs on the leader's shirt. The leader had performed in this case no special task. He had no special virtue to deserve the extra cookie which he'd been given. Again, he'd been chosen at, he or she had been chosen at random less than 30 minutes ago. The status was nothing but luck. But still, it left that individual with the sense that the cookie should be theirs and the entitlement that he or she somehow was deserving of the extra fortune that had been presented. This experiment may help to explain to all of us CEO pay, Wall Street bonuses, and some of the inequities we sometimes see in corporate America and a lot of other human behavior. But it also is relevant to all of you that were chosen to attend this conference or that leaders are in your organizations and have been given special opportunities in your careers. In a general sort of way, you have been appointed the leader of the group by being involved in this particular event or task. You've now been given information that the rest of your colleagues may not have. And your may, appointment may not be as arbitrary as the ones that they did in their research study, but you must sense in some ways the luck that we have or the opportunities we've gotten in all of our careers at some point were a sense of luck and arbitrary and not always skill. Sometimes we're lucky in the parents that we're born to. We're lucky in where we are, have the opportunity to grow up. We're lucky that our company or organization exists and they saw value in us in being part of their team. We're lucky that we get introduced to other lucky people that we're able to network with who have opportunities that they can also present to us and increase our chances of getting even luckier throughout the rest of our careers. We're lucky that we also live in an opportunity-rich time in which there is no actual reason for you to have to sacrifice your interests. We all have the opportunity to achieve what we want to achieve. You've all been faced with an extra cookie, and all of you will be faced with probably many more of them throughout your careers. In time, you start to find it easy to assume that we all deserve those extra opportunities and cookies. And for all we know, we may. But you'll be happier and the world will be better off if at least you pretend that we don't. And never forget to be in service to others, lead by example, and initiate the change that we want to see. 
Where do we go from here? This is a great opportunity for all of us. Let's leverage it. Let's do something. Let's get connected and make the change we want to see. And again, I encourage all of you with questions, please reach out to me. I'm happy to share my experiences, opportunities, and context as it relates to maybe specific challenges you're facing in your organizations as you're transforming your quality assurance and testing functions. So again, you can find me at jbonine at tapqa.com. That's jbonine at tapqa.com. Feel free to reach out to me there. I'm also open to answering questions if you email me um, and connecting with all of you that have more questions and that this spurred some interest maybe in these topics for all of you. We can only share so much in this short period we have together, but I'm absolutely open to helping as all of you move and evolve and make the changes you want to make. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you for being part of this session, and thank you for attending. Enjoy.